Haven Conservation Center with Gabby Scholar. And you know this has been coming. We've been leading up to this. We, we had the uh, covered the Gibbons during the podcast, and then we also had the director and producer and Gabby with the, the film Violet is Blue. So you've heard that interview, but today I just had to come back to the Given Conservation Center to talk to Gabby personally just about running the center and what she does. So welcome, and Gabby, thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you so much for coming back and uh, visiting the center. Yo, it's <laughs> this is a beautiful area of California, and you know if you're in the area, you have to come. You have to come. So just to set the scene where I'm here is we're sitting in the middle of the Gibbons Center and around us are, how many Gibbons are there here again? We have 38 Gibbons. 38 Gibbons. I can, you might hear them a little bit and if we're fortunate, they might break out in song during the interview, uh, but it's fascinating just to look around. They're active, they're swinging around and kind of curious to what we're doing. But um, Gabby, can you kind of tell the, you know, give us some of your background, but tell us how you came up about coming to the Gibbons Center. So, um... I'm a biologist and I uh, wrote my thesis on gibbons and um, besides interested in animals and animal behavior, I was also interested in philosophy and psychology and what makes us different from animals. And um, uh, as I was taking classes uh, at the University of Szeged in Hungary, uh, every summer I worked at the Budapest Zoo, and uh, this is where I met my professor, Dr. Maria Uihei. She was a philosophist, and uh, she was studying self-recognition in Gibbons, and I was just uh, observing her from a little bit further, just uh, the different studies that she was doing at the zoo. And uh, when it was time to write my thesis for my uh, master's degree, I asked her if I can work with her. and. Um, she gave me a job to record a gibbon at the zoo uh, near my university. So I started going there early morning to record the gibbon song. And um, like as many students, you know, it was hard for me to get up early and get to the zoo. But I learned pretty quickly that if I want to catch the gibbon song, that I, I have to be there at sunrise. So I started recording this young gibbon. Uh, he was a northern white chick gibbon and he was changing his song. Uh, young gibbons uh, sing the female song and uh, when they turn around six and a half years old uh, these males start practicing the male part but it takes months and months to develop the adult male song so it was very interesting for me to go there and record this development and um, when I was finishing this project I started working with my professor and we visited different zoos in Hungary and uh, did different uh, studies, cognitive studies with the Gibbons. And she was the one who told me about, about this place. Uh, she knew Alan um, and they were communicating, exchanging emails about Gibbons. So uh, she told me about this place. And when I finished the school, when I graduated in Hungary, I wrote to Alan, the founder of the center, and I asked if I can uh, come here to volunteer to learn English. and. Um, uh, just work with him. So I came here in 2005. I was a volunteer here. I, when I first arrived, I didn't speak English. I just I was just excited to be here and uh, learn about more, learn more about Gibbons and uh, work with them. And the first six months I worked every day, but it wasn't really work. I was just uh, it was just passion. I was just happy to be here to hear the Gibbons every morning, wake up with their song, and. Uh, I felt like every day I'm learning something new, so I was just, that was seriously the happiest time in my life, the first six months. Yeah, I bet, I bet, I bet, it's, it, oh, and it, again, in the documentary, it, it, it's an amazing story, you know, not just about the Given Center, about you, about the other workers mm -hmm. here, and, you know, again, conservation heroes that, it, it blows us away, talking to, uh, to people around the world like yourself. Can you kind of talk about the Gibbon Center itself. I know in the documentary they cover it uh, pretty well, but maybe for our listeners, especially ones around the world that won't have a chance to, mm -hmm. to possibly see it yet, can you just talk about how the Gibbon Center was founded and, and where you are today? Yes, of course. So uh, the center was founded in 1976 by Alan Mutnik, and um, he moved here uh, in Santa Clarita in the 1980s. Uh, but the whole thing started when he was only a child. He was growing up on the Tarzan movies, and he was nine years old, just uh, a child, like a very rambunctious kid, who was climbing the trees, and 
uh, when he heard the Gibbon song in the Stars and Movies, he felt he was in the rainforest. And his parents took him to the zoo. He saw the Gibbons there. And uh, he told his parents that he wanted to dedicate his life to Gibbons. At nine years old, he was already had uh, that kind of passion that he just wanted to create a place for Gibbons. So uh, when he was in his 30s, he had a small zoo uh, in Chatsworth. And he didn't have Gibbons. He felt that he needed to work with other primates first, other animals, because Gibbons are such a special primate, such a sensitive primate, that uh, he needs to learn how to care for other species first. But uh, when he was like 35, there was an ad in the newspaper, somebody had a pet Gibbon, and uh, they didn't want to take care of it anymore. So Alan heard about the newspaper, and uh, heard about that gibbon and uh, he took him to the center. So he had this first gibbon as somebody's pet. Uh, he started to take care of him and he imported a female for him. Once you have two gibbons, you know what happens. So then he produced offspring. And uh, But besides he had this one pair, uh, he continued learning about these animals, continued learning about gibbons. He was a self-taught expert. He never finished college. But he was uh, reading papers and uh, consulting with other scientists and conservationists about gibbons until he realized that these animals really need protection. And he established a primate center here just for gibbons. And um, in the past, we had seven species. Today, we have five species of gibbons, but all uh, Gibbons, all different species that are really need attention, like we have the northern white cheek gibbons that are critically endangered, uh, Javan gibbons that are also endangered, and um, we were the first one that bred Javan gibbons in the U.S., and now we have uh, our offspring living in Greensboro, in Fort Wayne. Uh, we've been also having northern white cheek gibbons here. We have nine offspring that born here. And um, so what Alan was started, uh, he become part of uh, copto breeding programs, uh, part of the species survival plan for several uh, endangered species of gibbons to try to preserve them, to try to make sure that they never become extinct. And working together with, with different zoos and conservation centers, uh, we're able to have a safe population of uh, rare species of gibbons that if something happened with them in a wild, if they become extinct, uh, we have a safe population that genetically diverse that can be used to repopulate areas in a wild. And at the same time, uh, we also have these animals here as ambassadors for the wild gibbons that uh, enable it enables us to educate people about gibbons and uh, all the different threats that the gibbons facing in the wild uh, so we can uh, educate people about them and uh, change their behavior so they can help save these endangered species. Right, right. I think it's uh, it's fascinating to hear you talk because it's, it's clicking off so many things in my head <laughs> as far as, you know, somebody goes, why do you have 38 gibbons in the middle of California? And when you realize, you know, the, the northern white, cheek gibbons right behind us that we talked about in the podcast you know when there's a thousand and, and you have 10 like that they're gold yes. they're priceless yes. genetically they they're priceless are so precious and um like we have gibbons here that are actually unrelated to the coptic population in other zoos in the u.s so these individuals are genetically very viable. Uh, but we also have now animals that are uh, very old, like we have Ivan, who's like 45 years old. And uh, besides we particip participate in Coptic breeding programs, we also provide lifetime care for these older animals, these senior animals, and uh, we just take care of them. And as we do that, we continue learning about their care. So we, I'm become a husbandry advisor for Gibbon. So, um, Besides helping the species to survive, uh, make sure they never become extinct, uh, we also have other gibbons worldwide to how to care for them. Yeah, I think that, you know, it's one of the things I got from the, mm -hmm. the documentary was the importance of the center and the, the, learn, the scientific data that you're generating. We're going to get to that in a mm -hmm. little bit, but, yeah. you know, I think that's something not to, to miss in, in an interview like this is, you know, why are these centers important? Because this isn't a rescue center that, you know, we've, we've done some interviews in the past, you know, with big cats and some other species. 
you know, this is a, a conservation center that's focused on preserving this species, or, you know, species of gibbons. Yes, and um, so it makes us kind of different. We're not like a zoo because we only open for just a few uh, hours on the weekends. We're also not like a real sanctuary. Uh, because we do participate in captive breeding programs. So we kind of a, a mixed organization and we like to call us as a conservation center. And uh, we believe that it's important that we specialize on given. So that's why we have so many at one location. Um, still we we cannot save gibbons just doing the work mm -hmm. here so we like to partner with our organizations and different zoos uh, with the captive breeding programs and uh, management and also with different sanctuaries just to to make uh, just to um, share what we know about gibbons and how to care for them right it's important it's important you know uh, to share knowledge so I guess is you know I have a question is the director now that you're the director of yeah. the center like what is your responsibilities that's just daunting <laughs> with all these animals <laughs> so um, as because we are small organizations we only have four staff that's including me so we do everything so as the director I'm also responsible of animal care I clean them I feed them. Uh, I've also helped with enrichment and helped with building enclosures, but I also responsible for like long-term goals, our mission, uh, which way we are heading, uh, also writing grants, uh, um, train volunteers, and um, uh, the different research projects consult with the different uh, other organizations so just kind of doing everything so I, I don't even like to think about all the different responsibilities <laughs> it's 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 not an eight-hour job no uh, it's it's like a seven hour seven days job so yeah. I, I don't really have a day off like today uh, I have a day off <laughs> and I'm doing the interview and yeah. uh, dealing with other things but I mean the, you can look at it as a job and um, it is a lot of responsibility but it's also give us a lot of power and not just to me uh, what makes that also special with having a small team uh, a small very dedicated team that each of my uh, team members they can do uh, whatever they want to do like if one of my assistant wants to go to the field to study events go ahead uh, we're gonna try to get funding for it and and if that's what you want to do you can do it I send them to conferences and workshops and um, we all try to do fundraisings and events and um, so we all work together so I think that um, it's a lot of work um, to, to just kind of run this place uh, but I think because we have so much power at least we feel that we we're making a difference we each making a difference uh, I think that's also keep us going and, and it's it's fascinating and, it, and it's, uh, it's it's heartwarming I think <laughs> the stories that we like to tell is you know these animals in the wild are, are, are facing such dire circumstances but there's a Gabby out there fighting for for these animals, this species. You yes, know, and Alma and Jody and yeah. Jesse and, and then all the people uh, that we met at different conferences and workshops, uh, we also like to tell their stories. And uh, that's again one of our function here to represent organizations and sanctuaries in Asia. Uh, that doing like in situ conservation, that making sure that the gibbons have a habitat left, that rescuing gibbons from the wildlife trade, releasing gibbons back into the wild, and many people in the U.S. never heard about them. So we like to tell their stories, and we have signage here that tell organizations that doing the work in the wild, saving gibbons. No, it is. I mean, it's it's it's, it's, a, it's just it's just fascinating for all these species. But you're right. It's a it's a it's a worldwide effort. Yeah. It's just not yes. one yeah, place. Yeah. It's not just we we all work together right. to do this. Yeah. Right. Right. So, be, you talked about, so I think it's important for our listeners to know, too, you don't have a day off. You think you said you're doing this interview, you're doing other stuff that yeah. keeps you busy. You know, what's an average day like for you? Um, so, one, you can get bored with this job because every day is different. So, um, the, the other day, I set my alarm at 5 a.m. because I wanted to do a live screening, uh, a live 
showing of the Gibbon song. So Gibbon sing at sunrise. So I was up to do the recordings and uh, show it to other people what is like a morning at the Gibbon Center. But I don't wake up every morning at, at the Gibbon song because I've been here for 14 years. So sometimes I actually sleep through it. <laughs> uh, but I, I also my day don't stop at like 4 or 5 p.m. So the the first the day start with the gibbon singing and we either up or we don't up we sleep through it sometimes we wake up uh there are mornings that the, we have to check on someone like if there's a gibbon sick that's my first thing when i wake up to go check on them uh we have the couple of weeks ago we had a, a rudder snake next to the gibbon enclosure and the gibbons were making an alarm so it's also important to tell that uh, we live on site. So the staff is on site and if we hear the Gibbons are upset about something, we go and check on them. Whether if it's in the middle of the night at 6 a.m. So then we relocate the snake. So, uh, but the, the care of the Gibbons is start around 7.30, 8 o'clock. That's the first feed and we feed them eight times a day. So oh, just uh, 38 gibbons, so it's a lot of uh, food prep and feedings and then cleaning. Uh, so making sure the gibbons uh, was taken care of. And then there are days when we schedule um, working on an enclosure, doing some repairs, doing putting in new branches, also doing enrichment throughout the day, or I, we need to do some um, uh, recordings like I'm also studying their vocalization so I like to do recordings uh, when I have time for it and then throughout the day between two feedings answer emails uh, communication with other zoos or uh, writing working on the grant so but there are times when during the day I just take care of the gibbons take care of the place uh, doing a produce run or we have to go pick up the mail so just 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 the daily operation and then once uh, the gibbons go to bed the last feed at like 4 30 p.m and then we finish cleaning so at around 5 30 6 o'clock we're done taking care of the center taking care of the gibbons uh, but there's always more work mm -hmm. inside on the computer so it's it's always my choice when i stop working <laughs> so i can work until midnight if yeah, i want to right. um and then sleep in the next morning or um it's also give me a feeling sometimes that it's like work is never ends mm -hmm. it's it's like there's always more needs to be done um but it's also give me a lot of flexibility so it's i set my work schedule your work schedule but it's a <laughs> yes, full one it's it, full it, it's it's yeah. full yes uh but again every day is different so uh like today i'm doing an interview tomorrow i will have a couple of girl scouts and gonna also interview me and oh, ask cool. questions about the center so we are open for that too and then there are days when we give a tour we have field trips coming here on a weekend we open from 9 30 to noon when the general public comes in and we lead a tour so um that's that's kind of covering it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a lot. I mean, do you ever? I mean, I just popped in my head, but do you ever just get a chance to like get a cup of coffee or tea and just come sit out, and, like the sun setting? I just think it would be so fun to like just sit and reflect on what you do and look at all these animals and yeah, and just be like you know appreciate yeah. what you do. Yes, yeah. Uh, that's why it's nice to be up sometimes at sunrise and see the sun coming up and the given starting their day. It's very peaceful here, so the staff's still sleeping and, and I can be just, it feels like just me and the Gibbons. Or at the end of the day, uh, the Gibbons are already settled down to sleep. They might not be sleeping, they might be just kind of relaxing on the branch. And yes, we have beautiful sunsets here. And it's just a very peaceful environment to right. be here. Right, right, right. It's So you said you had five species, so we had the northern white cheek, the Javan, we have also pileated gibbons, that's also an endangered species. We have a siamang, and uh, we also have eastern hula gibbons. The eastern hula gibbons is the only species of gibbons from the 20 species that are not endangered or critically endangered. Their status today is vulnerable, but it's uh, very likely that it's going to change. So right. we're happy to have them here. And anything we learn about the care or the eastern hula gibbons, their biology, their behavior, can be used to help the other two species of hula gibbons that are endangered. Now, can you, I mean, you personally, you've been doing this for so long. Can mm -hmm. you 
recognize the different calls and songs? Yeah, so each species of gibbons have a uh, different song. And most species, the male and the female, sing a duet together. Uh, there's only two species, the javan and the classes gibbon, that don't sing a duet song. And uh, so the male and the female song is different, and then certain parts of the duet they sing together or they overlap, and then other parts that they alternate their song. And then some species of gibbons also sing solo songs. So when no gibbon singing, then the javan males will start singing a solo song. And um, it's just different than the actual duet song. So, and then there are individual differences. And it's like one of my favorite things to stay in my bed and listen to gibbons and just kind of point out in my head like oh that was Arthur yeah. or that was Moni and I can recognize some individuals but awesome. but it's like when they start singing here it is 38 given sometimes singing together maybe a little bit less <laughs> uh, but it is a lot of voice coming together so it's actually hard to point out individuals mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. there's a lot of overlap but it's it's also a very unique place that we have uh, it's like a community of gibbons. Uh, there is no other place like that. There's five species sing together, and uh, they're leaders. We have like three gibbons that can start the song. Mm -hmm. And if we have like another one like Violet, if Violet feels like singing, she can, but no other gibbons gonna join in. <laughs> <laughs> but if we have Pepper, if she starts singing, other gibbons join in. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting. So these animals know each other. It doesn't mean that they like each other. Mm -hmm. uh, they tolerate each other. They they are neighbors, uh, but they communicate with each other. That's, <laughs> that's just fascinating. I mean, yeah. it's fascinating to think about. And, and you know, I've been pushing it on social media, but just again, I'll talk about it here. I mean, you have these different subspecies of gibbon from really different parts of mm -hmm. Asia. Yeah. And they're all singing together. I mean, it's just oh, it's just one of the the most. And I'm definitely if, if we don't. If they don't break out in song during the interview, I'll definitely clip in a little bit of that uh, for the interview here. But I guess if you tell our listeners, what's the purpose of the song with the Gibbons do? The, the most important purpose is to mark their territory. It's the long distance communication between different groups that carry information about where they are located and uh, how big is the group, how strong their family bond, their pair bond. And this is very important information, it's prevent fighting. So each group knows where their territory is located. It's like how we put up a no trespassing sign that we have a fence around the given center that tell the neighbors that this is our land. And the givens have to communicate that to able to uh, protect their area and mark their area and uh, make sure that everybody knows that they are there. And um, but it also helped them find a partner. If there's a single gibbon who just left the family group and looking for a partner, it will sing a solo song and try to locate another one. And they, before they even see each other, they can locate each other and start duetting and get to know each other. So it's like social media for gibbons. They, they pair up with each other by, by listening to each other's song and started communicating and duetting with each other. Um, and uh, for gibbons that sing a duet song, especially for uh, the Siamang and the East, the Hula gibbons, just as the whole uh, genus, they have a very complex duet. There's a lot of exchange between the pairs. There is a lot of coordination, even might be synchronization during the duet song that actually strengthens their pair bone because they actually have to practice to sing a well-coordinated duet. And it's been known that a new pair uh, that just met and they started singing a duet song, they don't sing such a well-coordinated duet than a pair that's been together for many years. So they need to practice their duet. <laughs> yeah, it's oh, it's beautiful. Yeah. I mean, it's beautiful. I wish we could like decode what they're saying. I guess you can start doing some of that research. You, you can, and, and that's something that I'm fascinated with, and that's what I'm collecting data on new pairs. I start recording them and analyzing it, and uh, I have record from like 10 years of different pairs that they've been singing a duet song, 
And then Gibbons are a lot like us. So some couples stay together for life and pair up forever. And there's also couples that they lose interest in each other or they start fighting. And that will show up in their duet song too. Mm. So they just stop coordinating so well. So these are also important information that can be also used um, for uh, conservation of Gibbons. Because uh, when they do a release, mm -hmm. uh, they usually release a pair of Gibbon or a family of Gibbon. And they want to release a very well-bonded family or a well-bonded couple. So it's important to know their behavior, to look at signs that the couple is bonded. And one of the signs is they're actually well-coordinated duet song. No, I was, I was, that's a great point because I was just going to go there like, mm. could you take that data and apply it to conservation in the wild? And apparently they are. Yes, there is. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And then other things. So besides singing, the gibbons make many other different sounds. One is like feeding calls. So right now, Jody is coming around mm -hmm. to feed the gibbons and the gibbons are making feeding vocalizations. And um, other sounds that when they saw the snake, they were making an alarm calls and we have a researcher uh, who was studying if the gibbons there by natural instinct recognize a snake as a um, an all that, that it, it's it's scary mm -hmm. because this is important when they release a gibbon uh, back in a wild that the gibbon would know naturally to be avoid snakes mm -hmm. or an mm -hmm. eagle or uh, mm -hmm. other scary things mm -hmm. so we were able to test that like showing them uh, we had a pet snake that we showed the gibbons and they were naturally answering uh, right. with an alarm call. Good, good. And Even to a picture of a, gib uh, a, a snake. A snake, really? Yes. Oh my goodness. Uh, actually, the gibbon that uh, just next to us. Mm. Uh, so they have these uh, applications for iPods and iPhones for toddlers and they show like a picture and if you push the picture, it will make the sound of the animal and we have Kima who likes to touch screen and mm -hmm. he touched pictures and he pushed the snake and he come up as a rather snake uh, mm -hmm. with the sound and the, the, the like an animal and he pushed a couple more times and then he started making the alarm call and then grabbed the iPad <laughs> and throw it away <laughs> so it, it was uh, it's not really a, a scientific research right, it was just right. kind of a, like an, uh, a casual. test yeah, if they would do yeah. it yes yeah but, and, and <laughs> when uh, I was here a few weeks ago you talked about coyotes and bobcats yes. do they do alarm calls with them when they're around yes uh coyotes they usually stay outside of the fence but if the coyote is looking at the gibbons from the outside of the fence eventually they're going to start making an alarm and we had a bobcat here uh she had kittens here she was hunting for rabbits and uh squirrels and uh the gibbons when they saw the bobcat they were also making an alarm but they kind of get used to her after mm -hmm. a while mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, it's, I mean, it's just, oh, it's amazing work. It's amazing work. So can you talk a little bit about any studies you're, you're currently doing besides just the, the, the song? Mm -hmm. um, so the Gibbon Center been a long time uh, collaborate with other researchers. Uh, we had, uh, we have a, um, a collaborator, Lucia Carbone, who study Gibbon genetics. And whenever we do a, um, a genet, whenever we do a, um, a medical exam, like a routine medical exam, we try to collect uh, extra blood samples and send it to her so she can um, study genetics and uh, study how the different species evolved and uh, get more uh, information about the different species of gibbons. And then uh, I mentioned about the color change. There's other changes that gibbons uh, change their song, they change their color during development. Uh, but we can follow that through hormonal changes. So as they do go through different development uh, as they age, we can collect fecal samples and study the hormonal changes behind the song change or behind their color change. Uh, we, also, we can also study if there's any stress uh, affecting the gibbons. Like they are in a captive settings. We do have sometimes visitors. We want to make sure that it's not negatively affecting their behavior. So we had researchers who were collecting fecal samples and study stressed hormones. And uh, we can also give the gibbons different enrichment and again uh, look at fecal samples if it's affecting their uh, behavior in any other way. So. Um, 
we try to understand their biology and uh, besides all the different studies on uh, vocalization and behavior hormonal changes um, we want to make sure that um, we provide a good care for the gibbons that they have a, a, a happy life here um, a good life here so um, we try to improve the gibbons uh, care here right 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 and it's you know is there I guess addressing some of that it, have you started noticing besides I guess the the behavior stuff any differences in the species you know like is it, it's 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 just so fascinating that they have different chromosomes and just there's so much of a, a separation but then there's so much that they share in common. they share a lot of things yeah. so uh, given they are belong to the same family halobates uh, so we used to think there is um, only three genera of gibbons mm -hmm. and um, Ellen was involved with finding out that there's actually four different genera mm -hmm. and uh, the reason he was able to do that that he had Hula Gibbons here and he's sending a blood samples to scientists and they they find out that look this Gibbon have different chromosome numbers so uh, the, the Hula Gibbons they used to belong to the same mm -hmm. genus with mm -hmm. the Hylobates mm -hmm. and then they find out that oh this have different chromosome numbers it should be a different genus right yeah right. so right. that was so, very interesting yeah I mean, yeah that was many is, years uh, ago before I was even involved with Gibbons right. but just since I've been working with Gibbons given taxonomy kept changing mm -hmm. and uh, when I first started working with them there's only three genera and there's only uh, maybe like nine species of Gibbons and today there's four genera of Gibbons and 20 species of Gibbons so it's just keep changing right. and uh, it helps to protect them it's helps to preserve them it's important to know which species you are working with when you want to put them in a captive breeding program or mm -hmm. when you want to release them. No, I mean, genetics has changed yes. everything. It's yes. changed everything. And yeah. it's still, yeah. you know, it, yeah, it's really jumbling the trees of, of many, many species and, and yeah. subspecies. But, th but they are also very similar. So each species of gibbons have a song. They all live in Southeast Asia, Northeast India, Southern China. They recognize each other's song, even if they sing two different songs. Uh, if they are at the same location, if they are housed together, they're going to still try to sing a duet together or coordinate the, their song with each other. Some of their alarm calls are different for each species, but they still know if Betty, a hula gibbon, start making an alarm for a bird, the javan gibbon on the other side of the center, even if they didn't see the bird, they will answer it with the bird alarm. <laughs> so there is some universal language between oh, them. Crazy. But each is different. Uh, they have different colors, they have different vocalizations, they have very different temperament for species and of course for individuals. Right. So, um, and we keep learning. So we, we, we learning as we, we care for them. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, we one of the things we we've been hitting upon, especially a lot in behavior, and Angie's, you know, that's kind of her flavor mm -hmm. or her really what she loves to focus on. We talk a lot about culture mm -hmm. in different animal species. Like yeah. we started with orcas, like we just like they demonstrate culture, and now we talked about wolves. And so I would think in primates, especially, there, there's a, there's some culture. Like, do you see some of that? You know, the the, the differences between the subspecies. You know, I mean, dialects and. Yeah. There definitely. So yeah. the, there are recordings in a wild from different groups of northern white cheek gibbons. Uh, they have slightly different vocalizations. So there's definitely different dialects. And then just certain behaviors that we see here at the center with like this community of gibbons and their low culture and then what we see different things in their behavior through generations so we have one group uh peppers family um one female pepper's older sister started hiding food on the roof and then younger brother learned it and then younger sister pepper mm -hmm. learned it and and then her younger uh, brother learned it so it is just a behavior that one individual pick up and then the rest of the family the younger individuals learn it from each other or another things every morning the gibbons get monkey chow it's a dry food made for primates and we don't know which gibbon started. Uh, there might be different individuals that it's soaking the monkey chai in the mm -hmm. water, just putting it in there. And then their family members learn it. And then other gibbons, probably neighboring enclosures, picked up on that. 
or another one that it's a, a little real it's a very fun behavior so when the gibbon sing they like to make other sounds as they sing they like to bang and we have uh, this one female who as she was singing she would swing and kick the roof with her feet <laughs> and then made uh, just a big sound and then her partner started doing that mm -hmm. and then at some point we switched their partner so they all got a different mate and their mate also learned that well, so now we have and then probably some of their neighbors so now we have many gibbons who likes to do that as they swing they kick the roof and add this additional sound to their vocalizations it, so they learn from each other <laughs> yeah i mean just I, I guess my next question is like just how intelligent are gibbons you know on the scale we still opinion? we're still learning but uh so we know gibbons are not monkeys they mm -hmm. are apes they have a larger brain uh compared to a monkey to the same body weight um but they do have like a shorter attention span. They don't tend to use tools in a while, like you heard about chimpanzees, mm -hmm. orangutans uh, use different tools. Mm -hmm. um, gibbons don't use that in the wild, at least we don't know about it. It's hard to observe gibbons so intimately, so closely in a wild because they live high up on the trees. But we do see them here naturally use certain tools, like a simple, like just a stick just to make noise when mm -hmm, it hit mm -hmm, things mm -hmm. or they pick up a rock and rub it on the concrete also to make so, uh, noise with it or uh, there was a gibbon that I was observing in Hungary uh, he was living on an island exhibit and they give give him just toys uh, different plastic toys it was a bucket that he ended up sitting on it and he put it on his head <laughs> and he did play and throw it yeah. in the air but at some point he just decided that he's going to drink from it and he bring it down to the water next to the island um, dip it in the water and then carry the water up on a tree and was drinking from it so uh, there's another gibbon her uh, name was actually Gabriella mm -hmm. and uh, she was using like a cloth to dip it in the water and then just squeeze it and drink with it mm -hmm. so they can use uh, tools like simple tools on their own and they can also learn to use single tools like a rake shaped object mm -hmm. to pull food closer to them and we have scientists that come here to study their cognition and study uh, tool use in Gibbon so they uh, but they need the scientists have to have a lot of patience to work with Gibbons because Gibbons rather sing and swing and play and they just don't sit still very long right. like another species like an orangutan well i mean you talked about yeah. them looking at the ipad and, and recognizing stuff so I mean, right it's just a high level of intelligence yes too. Yeah. but they last for 10 seconds and the <laughs> next thing they want to eat the ipad <laughs> <laughs> or just grab it and throw yeah. it away so they they have a shorter attention span um and you have to kind of work with them kind of faster uh mm -hmm. because they just lose interest yeah so do you have uh, any favorite given stories? I know, uh, you know, working here for, for so long, but do you have any that are just like, you're like, oh, that was just an amazing experience? Uh, I think you just have too many. First, I have favorite given, mm -hmm. so... Uh, we won't tell anyone. Right? Yeah, I won't, won't tell them. We, we, sit, ne we sit next to him, yeah. so... Uh, there is lo So what really touched me with Gibbons and what I, I just fully love with them it's just seeing all the different intimate behavior. Gibbons are very emotional, and um, some of their behavior is so similar to humans, like uh, they hold hands. Uh, they might even walk together holding mm -hmm, hands, mm -hmm. or like a pair uh, that are like a bonded couple, and you know, primates, they groom each other. Mm -hmm. But to observe Gibbons and see how they intimately touch each other's face and groom each other's face, and they're so gentle with each other, uh, they hug, they kiss sometimes, so uh, just these emotional behaviors that I, I'm just very interested mm -hmm. in. Or seeing a mother-infant interactions, or uh, we, s Gibbons as a family group, uh, they raise their offspring together, so the younger offspring, everybody participate caring for them. The mother, of, of course, provide the primary care, but then the father also helps share food with them and play with them, sometimes even holding and carrying the infant, and all the older siblings playing with the youngest one, and they learn to be gentle with them, otherwise they're going to get in big trouble with their mother. Right, right. So. And they play and they giggle. I don't know if you're getting, uh, if you're recording that. 
Well, we have a pair up right now next to us, and they are giggling and tickling each other, and they're making playful sounds. Right, right. So um, I don't have like a particle story because it's almost like I have too many. Too many. Too, too many. many. Need to write a book. But yeah, they're just uh, their behavior is so similar to us. So looking at that, you know, the the conservation center, you know, and I'm, we covered some of the pressures, but from your experience talking to experts around the world and your knowledge, what are some of the primary pressures that Gibbons are facing right now? So the two biggest issue, one that they're losing the habitat is deforestation and the other one is hunting. And um, it's like for certain populations, one is a bigger threat than other, but it, it really is depending which population of gibbons we are uh, working with. Um, the hunting is it's a big issue because uh, it's not just you know poor local people going in the forest and killing a few and eating them. Um, it's also for the wildlife trade, for the, the animal traffic that they use these uh, endangered species and selling them openly on Instagram, on, on other social media uh, uh, pages, and uh, they're keeping them as a pet, they're using them as a tourist attractions, and, and it's not regulated, it, it's not legal, but it's just not enforced, and it's just, they don't, people, they try to enforce it, they just don't have enough power, and they don't have enough people to actually go after them. And uh, it's like something that I see daily on Instagram because I follow tags like Gibbon or Gibbon Monkey. Of course, they are not monkeys, uh, but that's how they share it. And you see people in touristy areas, Bangkok, uh, Thailand, or Bali, they go to the beach and they're holding a Gibbon. The Gibbon is on a leash. It's a baby Gibbon. And for each pet Gibbon, we don't know how many were killed. They go in the forest and shoot the the parents from right. the tree wait for the mother fell with the baby and they sell it sell it as a pet so um it is a big problem and there's hundreds of gibbons there are in different sanctuaries in asia they were rescued from this terrible wildlife mm -hmm. trade and uh now we have to take care of these animals and if they are healthy physically and mentally, they try to release them back into mm -hmm. the wild. But unfortunately, many of these pet gibbons die while they being in private hands because they don't know how to care for them. Or they transfer disease from humans because they share food with them. They, they, they don't know what they have. So we are so closely related to gibbons. We share about... 96, 97 percent of our DNA with them, mm -hmm. so many disease can easily transfer from us to gibbons. And if they have a human virus, like the human herpes virus, mm -hmm. a gibbon can never be released back into the wild mm -hmm. because they can endanger the wild population. So that's that's one big issue. And the other big issue is deforestation. They're losing their habitat for plantations, coffee, tea, palm oil plantations, for paper products. And like areas like they say like uh, one and a half acre of forest get lost like every minute yeah, or something. Yeah, it's crazy. It's, yeah. it's, crazy. Yeah. It's, a, it's like large scale of deforestation. Mm -hmm. And when you tell that to the visitors, tell to the public that the forest is burning mm -hmm. in Brazil, the mm -hmm. forest is burning in Indonesia, mm -hmm. and the trees are getting cut down, they don't really understand that we are responsible. We are here in the U.S. and in Europe. Uh, people all over the world are responsible mm -hmm. for that because we are the one who eat the meat. We are the one who buy the product that have palm oil. We are the one who keep buying different paper product and we don't use recycled enough. Right. Um, and since we are behind the issue, we, we can actually make a difference. No, that's a great point. I mean, we was talking about, yeah. you know, vote with your dollar mm -hmm. and, and, you know, use sustainable palm oil, which, you know, is something we, we need to keep pushing and, and being careful on the products we choose because yes. companies are taking notice. I mean, major corporations are taking notice. So. Yes. Yeah. You can actually tell the company if you buy something in a store and you read there is palm oil in it, you can reach out to the company and ask how it was produced. And if it wasn't produced sustainably, you can force that company. You just say you're not going to buy it. And other people go behind you and mm -hmm. they're not going to buy it. They're going to have to change. Yeah. 
yeah, yeah. And that's 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 been a wonderful strategy on on trying to work on some of this, yeah. this conservation. So just a few more questions. <laughs> Let's let you enjoy your sure. day off. Thank you. Um, you know, I always like to ask this to my guests, and it, it's something that you know I've always felt strongly about. But I want to I want to see uh, how you feel because a lot of people are like, why are we spending money on gibbons or you know elephants or that that dumb frog over there that, mm. that doesn't you know it it's on 10 acres and that's it. I don't care about that frog. Do you think, you know, for all these species, especially gibbons, but do we have a moral obligation to fight and save them? Uh, I think, I think we do. And, um, so one thing, it's not just about gibbons and orangutans and that frog. Uh, we're not just protecting those each species. We are also protecting their habitat. And, um, of course, I care about gibbons. I care about everything. Mm-hmm. I care about low frogs too. I know, I know. I know. Um, but like, okay, so the, the rarest primate is the Hainan gibbon. There is only about 23, 25 individuals left. Does it make sense to put effort saving them? I think yes, because these they are key species uh, for their habitat. And... Um, I also feel they have the right to exist because they are on this earth for with us. I mean, we are we are not like an outside species and just over everything else. We are part of it. Mm-hmm. So we we try to protect the earth because we are in it. Uh, of course, we care about these each species and every conservationist care a lot about their own species that they are focusing on. Um, but um, it's just more than that because each species have some kind of role uh, in the whole ecosystem and we don't always understand what their role is um, and because we don't understand we know, we need to continue learning about them um, and, and just to preserve them uh, just like how we preserve libraries and, mm-hmm. and old buildings mm-hmm. uh, I think it makes just as much sense that to to protect our home, mm-hmm. like we don't want to destroy our habitat because we are in it. Right. So, um, but of course, because I care about gibbons, uh, I put all my energy and effort to saving gibbons. But at the same time, I also know uh, that I'm also trying to preserve their whole habitat, the mm-hmm. forest that they are uh, belong to, because in a larger scale, that's going to save a lot of other species in there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's the whole ecosystem. Yes, yeah. yeah. And they're a big part of it, mm-hmm. so it's kind of that umbrella, umbrella species concept that we save these animals, mm-hmm. all the little ones that we don't think about under them, yeah. thrive and yeah. survive. Yeah, yeah. And then conservationists like to pick uh, certain species, often like larger species like elephants and uh, orangutans, because people feel more emotional towards them they already know a lot about them so it's easy to change their behavior because they can connect with them uh given some smaller smaller Mm -hmm. primates smaller apes but because they are so closely related there's so many behavior that we share with them i think when people come in and learn about them they can connect with them Mm -hmm. and that's what they take home that they remember Howard, how he was playing with his sibling, mm-hmm. and uh, at the same time as they take our tour, they learn about their habitat and why they are endangered, and they take that message home. Right, 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 right. This is amazing. Um, I guess this is my final question. How can our listeners help you at the Gibbon Conservation Center? And then I think we've already kind of talked about mm-hmm. you know being smart on their consumer when they're consumers. But how can we specifically help you here at the Gibbon Conservation Center? So uh, we always need volunteers. So we have a small staff, four people working here. And uh, we need volunteers to help uh, prep food for the Gibbons, help us keep the place clean, help with fire clearance, help us build enclosures. So if you have extra time, please sign up to volunteer. Uh, as a small no- nonprofit, we always depend on people uh, donations so uh, and right now we are in front of a very big step in our history uh, we need to relocate the given center uh, we lost ownership of the land and um, we have about two more years uh, to be on this lease and to be in this location and we're looking to buy another piece of land uh, near the coast so 
it's a big goal. We tried to raise a million dollars uh, to buy another land and uh, build a new center. And um, the new center will be able to host more students, uh, have a library education center. So besides we rely on, on your donation and your support, we also give back to the community by educating people about givens. No, oh, yeah, it's a, it's admirable, and I, uh, you know, if you're in the Southern California region or you come visit, you definitely should make a trip out here. It's just one of the most unique spots on earth. You know, it's <laughs> where are you gonna have this many gibbons in one spot, and then when they break out in song, my goodness, which I'm gonna uh, clip in at the end here, where you can uh, you can listen to them sing. Yeah. It's it's just one of the most unique spots on on the planet that people that love animals, love conservation, need to come visit. Yes, please see. come, and we are open every Saturday and Sunday from 9:30 to noon. So, and we do a tour at 10 o'clock, so everybody can join the guided tour, and uh, we share why we are here and talk about the different species. And you can also learn a lot about uh, different individuals. So it's like a, a very interesting tour that you can take, and. In, during the tour, uh, or towards the end of the tour, the given start singing that you can hear two miles away. So yeah. it's just kind of, uh, and we tell at the tour that the givens might start singing, but for someone who never heard it, uh, it's amazing for me to see people change, like mm -hmm. their face, like, oh my God, what just happened? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> no, they are actually singing. So it's really surprising for people that never heard it before. And and uh, so just like the two biggest uh my favorite part of the job is mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. when I uh, do the tour and the gibbon start singing and I see people just just they're completely amazed. Right. And then the other favorite part just just to be near them and learn about them and um, it's like because it's so much joy right. to to work with them. That's why it doesn't feel like work. Yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. Well, Gabby Scholar, she's the director of the Gibbon Conservation Center. Thank you so much Thank for you. allowing us to come and, and uh, see you again. And again, the, the movie Violet is Blue, the a Tale of Gibbons and Guardians, That's uh, don't forget that. That, that. That's out there. We can actually see Gabby and, and kind of get the story of the Gibbon Conservation Center. So we'll definitely be... You know, keeping our eye to that and letting our listeners know when you know you get a distributor that's like on Netflix or, or Amazon would be amazing for you guys. Um, yeah. But thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah. And uh, I wonder if you want to try to get the gibbon singing. Yeah. Like do a. <laughs>